Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I'm Patrick Heller from the Natural Resource Governance Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to this event where we'll be talking about the New Producers Group and our Fostering Resilience Project. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of, I know you all can't all see each other, just to give you a little bit of a sense of who's joining us today, we had over 250 people register from 53 countries. So quite a, a, a large group uh, and a diverse group of interested people. Um, and we're really excited to talk about the project, um, but in particular to talk about uh, what new producer countries are doing to manage, regulate, and oversee uh, their oil and gas sectors uh, in a time of great turbulence in the industry. Um, just a word about the New Producers Group for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, the New Producers Group is uh, co-organized by Chatham House, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the Natural Resource Governance Institute, my organization. And the group gathers members from governments in over 30 countries that are, have either recently begun producing oil and gas or uh, find themselves on the cusp of, of oil and gas production. And the group really exists as a mechanism for sharing of experiences, um, struggles, challenges, questions, approaches, ideas. And so for the eight, I think it is years that the group has existed, we've really built a strong network uh, for information sharing and, and, and idea generation. And what we're gonna be talking about today is something that um, has been the real focus of the group over the course of the last year. Um, we are coming on um, the uh, one year anniversary of the launch of this series, um, which started really right around the time that the COVID pandemic um, really spread worldwide and impacted everyone's lives in all of the countries that the group is, is, is active in, but also in particular impacted the oil and gas sector and its prospects. And so right as the industry started to spiral, um, there was a real demand that grew up within the group. Let's talk to one another about what's happening. What are we experiencing? And so we tried to mobilize as quickly as we could. And we launched a series of discussions, webinars, meetings, expert presentations that has lasted up until today. Um, during that time, members of the group have shared what they've been going through, right? Um, slowdowns in investment, um, pressure from the contractors that they're working with. Um, as well as questions about whether the pandemic and the, and the shock that it was having on the oil and gas sector might speed up the global energy transition um, with longer term effects for their industries. And so um, what we're gonna do today is to share a little bit of what we've found or kind of what some of the, some of the perspectives have been of the member countries um, over the course of that year. And in particular, we'll be sharing some research uh, done by Valerie Marcel uh, from Chatham House, who's the project lead of the New Producers Group and who wrote the report, Fostering Resilience, which we'll be discussing or which will be animating our discussion today, where she really tried to draw core conclusions from the discussions, uh, highlighting points of consensus, illuminating points where different countries were having different, different experiences. Um, and so Valerie will present those findings to kind of really kick us off. And then we're quite fortunate to have uh, two speakers from governments in new producer countries themselves. Uh, we'll begin with Benjamin Asante, who is Director of Petroleum Upstream at the Ministry of Energy in, in Ghana. And Benjamin joins us um, after a long career in the oil and gas sector, including more than 30 years with the Ghana Na National Petroleum Corporation before taking up uh, his current role at the ministry. Benjamin holds degrees in geology, geological engineering, geophysics, and law from several prestigious universities, including the University of Aberdeen, University of Trondheim, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. And then after speaking with Benjamin, we'll turn to Stella Opakas, who is Director of Mineral Resources at the Turkana County Government in Turkana, Kenya, uh, one of the regions where um, the prospects of, of, uh, of oil production have led to big expectations um, and, and significant challenges impacting the lives of people in, in the communities there. Stella has over 15 years of experience 
in the petroleum industry in Kenya, including working for the National Oil Company, uh, as well as her, her role in the Turkana government. She's a chemical engineering graduate of Gubkin Russian State University of Oil and Gas in Moscow. Um, so thanks very much to all three of our speakers today. Thanks to all of you for joining. Um, I'm gonna get out of your way in a minute and let our speakers really uh, take, take the floor. Um, just a couple of ground rules. Um, it, you can begin, even as the speakers are going, you can begin um, posting questions, reactions in the Q&A box. Um, I will try to assemble the questions and try to get to them as many as, as, many of them as we can when we get into the, the discussion session. Um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, it is a public on the record meeting. Um, and so we're looking forward to your feedback, but we wanted to, uh, we wanted to share that at the outset. Um, I'd like to, just before turning it over to Valerie, we have a poll question for you, which is gonna help us take the temperature of the room, uh, the virtual room that we're in. And here's the question, have we reached global peak demand for oil? Um, None of us knows for sure, but we wanna see what you all think around the room. So take a minute to, to share your answer. And Anuma, I can't see the poll results. So when you think there's a, a good number of people who've responded, if you can post them, that can let everyone see what the consensus is, if there is one. Okay, so um, we've got almost 60%, I would say a clear majority who think that no, we have not reached global peak demand for oil and the rest split evenly between yes and, uh, and, and not sure. Um, keep this question in mind and keep your thoughts in mind as we continue uh, with the discussion. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to you, Valerie, to kick us off. Thanks very much. Thanks, Patrick. Um, that's uh, interesting about the, the poll results. I'll come back to that in a minute uh, on how that compares with what we discussed in our series. So. Um, as you mentioned, one year ago, uh, when public life really began to shut down across the world, we started at the New Producers Group this series of virtual meetings to aim to help our governments uh, understand the crisis, uh, share experiences, map out what the world would look like post-COVID, and adapt strategies and policies to that changing environment. Um, and these meetings were nearly weekly, well, especially during the first month when there were just so many questions, uh, and they brought together between 50 to 100 government officials. Um, and while, of course, um, you know, there's so much to gain with in-person meetings, and we feel that even more today, one year on, than we did then, but there's, there were a lot of advantages to having remote meetings because there were no travel costs and it was easier for agencies that are under-resourced and that wouldn't be able to travel to attend more people from different agencies and within those agencies. And so the active members of the group doubled to 600 during this period. So that was a real benefit of, um, of, of these remote uh, exchanges. The kind, this is kind of the profile of the organizations that participated. And as you'd expect, the majority were from NOCs, regulators, and ministries of energy. But we had a, a, good, a good chunk of, uh, of participants from environmental agencies and ministries of finance and planning. And that's really valuable to uh, support a sort of a more joined up discussion uh, to analyze the crisis and what you will do after the crisis. This is the profile of the participating countries. Um, and so we had some non-member countries as well joining. Uh, and uh, you know, I should note they're welcome to become members because it's an open group. So I wanna take you back to March a year ago. And if you recall, you know, it, there was of course the health crisis, which as Patrick outlined affected people at an individual level, an organizational level, national plans uh, were affected, but it was also an oil crisis. Um, there was an oil price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia that flooded the market with crude just at a time when demand for oil was collapsing as a result of COVID. 
there was uh, uh, it even led to a, a negative WTI price on, on futures for the, the 20th of April. But it was interesting that um, there was some optimism among the group, nevertheless, that in March, when we asked them whether the price of Brent would recover above $30 a barrel by the end of the year, the, the majority said yes, which at the time seemed wildly optimistic to me, but it was completely spot on. And significantly, half of those surveyed also thought that global peak demand for oil had been reached. So I find it quite interesting that today, a year on, a majority would, would actually say that no, the, the peak had not been reached. Um, and I think the, the view on, the, on reaching the peak or not is really pointing to uh, optimism or not regarding the longer term outlook for the industry and the ambitions that uh, the emerging producers have for uh, their sector. So that was Q1, Q2 was even worse. Uh, so it definitely got worse before it got better. Then thinking about, we, we were polling the governments in the group on, in March on the impact that they were seeing from low prices. And the highest was, uh, the highest impact was delay to final investment decisions, uh, work plans, lower licensing interest naturally, companies seeking to change terms, for those in the group that have production, it was lower export revenues and questions from stakeholders were the, the highest uh, sort of concerns that the government had, the government had. So were they prepared for this crisis? Um, interestingly, in April, when we asked, do you feel, what do you feel is your degree of preparedness in the event the crisis lasts three months? It was quite a spread response but the majority feeling they were somewhat uh, prepared. And when we asked instead, uh, what is your degree of preparedness if the, if the crisis lasts 12 months? Well, the majority were not at all prepared. Um, and I think that's not, uh, that's not a snapshot that's only true for emerging producers. Um, now, we looked at some crisis response um, uh, mechanisms. And we, the majority of our group thought that communications was the most valuable crisis intervention. And they were fielding a lot of questions from industry partners, from government, from the public, etc. And the, when we held a sort of communication clinic, the main problem we found was, how do you field questions when you don't have the answer? And that really points to the, the high level of uncertainty that the governments were facing at this period. And frankly, that uncertainty continues today because there is still so much we don't know about the economic recovery, the path of the pandemic, um, vaccine rollout, et cetera. The other aspect we looked at in terms of crisis response were legal issues. Um, because as I mentioned, a large portion of the group um, was concerned about um, operators not fulfilling their contractual obligations uh, through like the work program commitment. And by April, half of the participants had already had instances where force majeure was invoked by oil company partners. So these were real issues for um, that, that, that the issues came very quickly, I'd say in this crisis. So then our focus turned to understanding what the new normal would look like after COVID. Would oil markets recover? Um, what would happen to investment in oil and in gas? And what impact would COVID have on the pace of the energy transition? And so we use scenarios to try to manage these multiple uncertainties. Uh, uncertainties like um, the path of the pandemic, uh, the economic impacts locally or globally, policy responses in terms of climate commitments or, um, or in terms of rebuilding the economy and, and supporting um, uh, the building back better. So there, the scenarios were very instrumental to our whole discussion on the impact of the crisis on, on the energy transition. And as this graph shows, the majority of the group by July, after having had those discussions, uh, came out thinking that the, the 
the um, the COVID pandemic and the associated energy market disruption would speed up the transition. So now what happens uh, to investment in the petroleum sector and what does this mean for emerging producers? I think it was clear from our discussion really that boom time, boom time is over for the oil sector. Um, we heard a lot about how listed oil companies are looking for low cost, low risk, low carbon barrels, uh, gas and renewable. And this hits pretty hard at a lot of the emerging producers in our group. First, uh, the frontier countries or the frontier acreage, uh, which is, has, is it's more challenging to offer that lower cost, lower risk, uh, lower carbon barrels. So we would expect there will just be fewer projects and they will be the ones that can offer, um, say, string of discoveries that are closely, uh, more geographically close together, um, where infrastructure can allow more rapid monetization of the reserves um, and lower carbon intensity. For example, if there's infrastructure to capture gas and pipe it to shore and give it productive use, uh, will be a lower cost, lower carbon um, project. But some, some countries in our group are still oil hotspots and they've had a string of discoveries and they will continue to attract investment. But even in those cases, um, the government planners should really be understanding the risks associated with fiscal dependence on the petroleum sector because of the uncertainty about the timeline that it offers and the value of the barrels produced. And they should also be thinking about building up local content that is not only useful to the petroleum sector. So I think resilience is a really useful concept in this context because you wanna think not so much about going, sort of patching things up to be back to where you were before the crisis, but building systems and strategies, developing policies that allow you to be prepared for the future. Um, and so for things like local content, that involves a, a, a significant rethink. Traditionally, local content has been focused on developing supply, local supply of goods and services for the, the petroleum sector, taking advantage of its high capital expenditure uh, to sort of kickstart something uh, domestically. But now the focus will need to be on developing local supply and goods and services that are for other sectors and that can also be used by the petroleum sector. In terms of licensing, it's difficult because um, there, that's a real challenge for a lot of the members of our group. Do you race to extract what you can while you still can at the risk of not having the time and the capacity to oversee that development and perhaps not gaining the full value from it? Do you put your licensing on hold and wait for more, you know, more opportune moment? Or do you shelve some of your projects? Um, in terms of macroeconomic planning, uh, resilience is, is really about understanding the risk of this volatile industry uh, and understanding those changed timelines can have a significant impact on your revenues going forward. Uh, the price will also could also be a, a quite lower than anticipated uh, and maybe also uh, factoring in raising, rising carbon prices or carbon costs. And I think resilience, I would, I would argue, is really um, comes through with integrated development planning. So where governments can break the silo that the oil, that oil has existed in within government and align it, align the plans for the petroleum sector with those for um, energy access domestically, climate goals, environmental goals, um, within the country so that that integrated planning can really build those resilient systems. So in conclusion, I think this series was really a, a ray of, of light for a lot of us, at least uh, certainly in our team, 
to be able to have this uh, opportunity to 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 think through all of these uncertainties and and map out something um, in an in, in an orderly informal collegial environment that was very uh, very positive. So I'll leave it there, Patrick. Thanks very much. Thank you, Valerie. Very uh, very valuable insights, and and you did a great job of summarizing quite a lot of content in a in in a very efficient way. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our experts from the new producer countries themselves. And Ben, I'm going to come to you first. And you know, the question that I wanted to to flag to you is, uh, you know, is a is a straightforward one in one sense, but a really complex one in another sense. And it's essentially, um, in what way have the events of the last year um, prompted a strategic rethink of the role of the oil sector in Ghana or the strategies that the Ghanaian government is is executing in order to, to manage the sector. Over to you, Ben. And then, uh, Patrick and uh, all the other panelists and uh, participants. Uh, as Patrick has said, my name is Benjamin and I work for the National, uh, the Ministry for Energy in Ghana. Uh, Patrick and uh, Valerie uh, for this opportunity to contribute to this important discussion. I mean, Ghana, like uh, all other oil and gas producing nations has not been spared. I mean, for the impact of the COVID. I mean, apart from global effects such as the fall of uh, oil prices and the revenue losses, uh, we have also had our own share in a lot of things. And I will look at that uh, from the sense of uh, policy rethinking, I mean, and then the licensing, as uh, uh, Valerie said, about has uh, been on the hold. And then uh, look at the national oil com company, what strategic uh, this thing uh, that we're going to do as far as the national oil company is concerned. But uh, Ghana was also compelled at some point last year to suspend all exploratory and appraisal. That those are time bound uh, uh, projects or activities when the companies in the country began to record some of these uh, cases of COVID in their facilities. So finally, only the three producing uh, assets were, were working and uh, we had to get uh, exemptions from the office of the president, from the national security, just for them to fly in, go through the COVID protocols and straight to the, to the platforms. And then when they are coming back, I mean, so they come two weeks earlier for their, for their rotation. And so that's what we did to sustain production. Otherwise, you know, uh, we depend on gas for power generation in Ghana. So we made sure these three producing uh, facilities or, or portfolios were working. To uh, us from the ministry, uh, liaising with the office of the president to get them to come to the platform. But uh, we are also looking at situations where we will want to encourage or incentivize oil companies because we finally had to put a hold on all the exploratory activities because we were coming for extensions on the on the petroleum agreement. So we decided to put a hold, uh, let everybody stop, especially appraisals and time bound activities so that when things normalize, we would just not, not, not give extension, but give back the time that was lost. So, so that, that, that is the idea that we just, uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, but just compensate the time that was lost for the time that uh, COVID started and we asked them to suspend activities. Yeah, uh, if you look at, there is also some uncertainty uh, regarding the place of Ghana in the future oil market, but we are hopeful that the country will find its feet as projects like the Ake development, uh, the Springfield and ENI development and the Greater Jubilee, if the Greater Jubilee project comes online. Or on stream. So we are looking at and uh, other projects that we think we will find our feet in the in the in the future oil market. But as of now, as you know, everything is on hold, and we are just having three assets being produced. That is the Jubilee and the Sankofa uh, Jubilee Ten and Sankofa Field. In terms of policy review, you know, there's a need to look at the royalty as we've been looking at royalty rates. The royalty rates charged in all the petroleum agreements since negotiated since 2005 
ranges between 4% and 12.5%. 12 12 but as you know, our petroleum law, section, section 85, provides for the payment of these royalties. Uh, what we're looking at as a policy is to try to vary uh, the royalty rate because it's been about the same for all these, uh, all these companies operating, whether in deep water, shallow water, or what amount of oil are they producing. So we are looking at a situation where we will try to have a sliding scale and that sliding scale will be tied to some factors like uh, the price of the oil or the price of the resource. So that as has been done in other countries, when the price goes up, uh, royalty might go up or when the price comes down, royalty might come down. We are also looking at the volume of uh, oil that is produced and tie the, the scaling royalty rate to that. Again, we're looking at the water depth, especially, you know, deep water is very expensive. So we're looking at a sliding scale for uh, as Nigeria uh, has, has done. I, I think I can have some facts for Nigeria. If you look at the water depth in Nigeria, uh, they have a different royalty rate for deep water producing, uh, production sharing contracts. Like in inland basins, it's 10%. As you move from water depths of 201 meters to about 500 meters, they have a royalty rate of 12. You know, and then when you go more than 1,000 meters of water depth, Nigeria doesn't even charge uh, royalty. So we are looking at some of these things as a way to encourage uh, encourage investors, I mean the IOCs, because you know royalty is taken at the top. Whether you are making profit or not, you have to pay royalty to government. So we are looking at some of this. And even another thing like uh, the stage at which production is, whether it's the ramping up time or when it has reached plateau, when production is about the same over a period, uh, or when it's at a declining stage. So these are some of the things we are looking at as far as uh, policy in uh, changing the straight royalty thing to a sliding royalty scale. I mean, it is still in the formative uh, and the discussion stage. These are some things we want to do. And about licensing, uh, other things we are also looking at is, uh, you know, definitely the law, if you know the law, the petroleum exploration law provides that uh, you can award blocks through open, transparent, and competitive uh, tender process, except in some cases where the rights can be awarded through direct negotiations or can be even reserved for the national air company. I mean, our law makes uh, all those provisions. What we intend to do to maintain the competitive approach, but modify it to take into consideration the ongoing cha changes in the upstream industry and the world. Changes may include the green rates in uh, and drilling in West Africa and Ghana. So looking at all these is what Taking this into uh, concrete terms, all we're looking at, we want to offer a drill-ready block and rely on and rely heavily on technology uh, and the online platforms to promote the blocks for you know instead of relying on road shows that we go during uh, conferences and all that, we also looking at a situation where blocks that have been relinquished or blocks that have that are not being active, we might have to relocate that through competitive bidding and then direct negotiations, especially in areas of deep water where technology is limited to a few uh, measures. We wouldn't want to go for licensing round where companies can bid but might not have the capacity to, 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 to operate in such ultra deep water. So these are some of the strategies that, although the law says we should go uh, first of all, uh, open, transparent, and competitive bidding. It also provides for direct negotiations, which uh, are at the discretion of the minister and of advice of his technical people and the regulator, we can also do uh, direct negotiations. Again, we are investing in data acquisition and we have already signed uh, multi-client agreements with some companies to acquire 3D seismic over the sedimentary basins of the country. Uh, we are also doing uh, mega surveys where different advantages of 3D seismic are being made to have a regional outlook of the, of the area. What we want to do is that instead of companies 
come in and we have a, a, a seismic option, we, the government, want to acquire the data to the specification, of course. We will not just acquire any data to whatever specification, but we have data around that we know the quality and what kind of acquisition parameters we use and the processing parameters to, to get the best out of the subsurface. So that when companies are giving the blocks, they don't spend too Going forward in the promotional activities, we will just uh, do a, web, a lot of website promotions. And for the national youth company, we are strategizing that they become operator along the line. So uh, in the operator position, we are giving the national company uh, to do the Botian project. They are also giving the block uh, one in the East Western Basin. And they are also going to acquire about two blocks in 2021. They are also trying to protect in most of the blocks. And uh, the GMPs with the Russian company uh, also play a key commercial part in managing interests in the various assets. The main issues, the other issues where the, the national company needs to be capitalized to also do what they need to do. So in conclusion, I would say these are the strategic thinking of the, of the ministry and the country as a whole so that we can uh, come back to uh, the activities before COVID setting. So thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm ready to, uh, to, to, to answer or maybe add more clarification if there need be. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Benjamin, um, for a very in-depth discussion of quite a lot of strategic thinking um, that the Ghanaian government uh, is, uh, is doing to, to try to push forward, um, much appreciated. Um, so Stella, we're gonna turn to you now to zoom in on the subnational perspective um, and to see how uh, the pandemic has been felt in, uh, in Turkana. Uh, my question for you is, um, as, the develop as developments in the county slowed down dramatically in the, as a result of the pandemic, what kinds of questions and reactions did you get from stakeholders and how did the local population experience the crisis in its, in its impact on oil and gas activities? Well, thank you very much, Valerie and the entire team for organizing this webinar. Um, just to introduce Trukana to the, uh, to the participants of this conference is that it is in a very remote part of Kenya, what is classified as marginalized. So the discovery of petroleum in this, uh, sec in this area, one was that uh, the, it, it was expected at least to help develop the local economy, improve the local social and uh, economic uh, problems. I mean, solve the social and economic problems that were there, which had been left by many years of marginalization in this part of the country. And uh, the main, uh, angle which the county government was looking at it is that the presence of petroleum should build the local economy. So when, uh, when we started having problems with, uh, when, when COVID happened and the operations had to slow down, there were very many uh, questions which were asked as county government, because for one, it is not a dual function. This is a function of the national government. But we as a county government come in because it is happening on the ground and the effects are felt by the people who are staying in this particular area. And uh, as we said, it was marginalized. So we had to uh, take the part of bridging the gap. So the first question was, is there a future for the project? One, especially when we saw during Valerie's presentation, when the price went to negative, everybody just got to panic mode and said, okay, this project, we don't know if there's going to be a future for the project. And this has also been, this conversation has also been um, enhanced by the uh, shift towards renewables. So the push for renewable energy. So people were wondering, is it really going to take off considering that we're not producing so much and uh, so that is one of the questions which is uh, key. And then the other question which is asked was that who is going to operate as principal investor in this sector? Because uh, we had uh, Talo put in a force majeure. Talo also had, Talo is the operator, Talo Oil uh, is the operator in Trukana, just to put it out there for other participants as well. Um, 
they put in a force majeure, they had to downsize their operations, downsize their staff. So, and this is all seen in the community. So people are now, I mean, and even it was out in the media that Talo is leaving and then Talo is not leaving. So, you know, once doubt is cast into, uh, into the community, people started wondering who is going to come next, considering that there, there have been various forms of engagement you know, with Talu CSR and the activities and projects which Talu was carrying. So people wanted to know who is going to continue and will they continue in the same spirit? And if there are issues which we had with them, how are they going to be uh, addressed? But there are also the, uh, uh, those who are optimistic and they would ask, uh, when will the process resume? Yeah, because uh, I, I mean, after some time, you know, people get, uh, fatigue setting and like, okay, we need to go back to, to normal. One, uh, people also wanted the um, project to resume because of jobs. Many people, as I said earlier, had lost jobs. So with the hope that the, that the project resumes, people will have their jobs back. And um, there were some uh, commitments such as bursaries for students, which this project has been funding. So with the decrease of, uh, or with the slowdown of activities in this area, what happens is that now um, maybe the contribution towards funding for these students has come down. So this, I mean, obviously has been a major concern. Business opportunities for the local community. As I said in the beginning, as the county, our expectation is that the, the um, crude oil activity going on in Turkana should engage with the local community. And how this was engaging, it was through uh, contracts. We had people doing businesses, we had people supplying uh, food, we had people supplying motor vehicles, uh, what you know, what is called the fleet program. So we had made the, the benefits were also trickling down to the local community. And apart from that, there were also grievances. So with uh, the activities that were going on in place, there were some grievances which were which had uh, been brought up by the local community with the investor. So during this period, the national government had formed what we call a Trukana County Grievance Committee. So the purpose of this grievance committee was to solve issues that was to arise from uh, between the uh, host community and the uh, investor. And uh, its representation came from the State Department of Petroleum, the Secretariat. So, and representation came from locals and national government officials who are engaged in this uh, process. Because you remember there was a time the early oil uh, uh, process stopped after community felt that they were not benefiting from this project. So what, what was decided is that we do, we must have a grievance committee in place. And this was taken up by the national government, but it's, it was constituted only for uh, a short period of time. It is not something that was going to be permanent. So, and it happened that during uh, COVID, the grievance committee term ended, but the grievances had not yet been stopped. I mean, we still have grievances from the host community. So what you find is that people are asking, okay, now who do we address the grievance to? So. Uh, the agreements has to be addressed. The project has stopped. I think the national government finds, okay, uh, at, at the moment we are on a go slow. Do we really need to form that grievance committee? So those are some of the questions which uh, ha we have been asked. And then what about the proceeds from the early oil uh, pilot scheme that uh, took off? Because uh, the people said the petroleum was sold to uh, to the international market, money was brought in. Uh, how do we get that money, or how do we get access to that money? So when when the operations uh, slowed down, so people are asking, okay, what happened? You took our oil, and we are not seeing any money from it. How can we get that money back? Uh, while in while that also was going on during operations, we had waste from. Uh, generated in the process. So we had mud cut cuttings piled up in some, in, in some sites. So when the operation stopped and you have mud cuttings piled up in various areas, who is going to handle these mud cuttings? And when you see that the company has downsized, we see um, uh, 
you know, uh, you have left the camp. So who is going to handle these environmental issues that are being brought up? So uh, this has also, and up to now, is still a very live matter for the host community because it is uh, something that needs to be addressed. But I must say that uh, it, is, it is being addressed. The national and county government are working together with the investor um, to address this particular issue. And um, there have also been changes because now Talo has downsized and now we are seeing a presence of Africa oil, a strong presence. And, the, and uh, so, you, you know, there's that, uh, things are not clear. So for the host community, they keep asking, so is it Talo, is it Africa oil? They're like, no, Talo is on to there, but then why are we seeing Africa oil here? So um, that's, that sort of like uh, leaves many questions to the host community. And also, uh, as it is, the Petroleum Act is being implemented. So we have the Petroleum Authority. It has now come into the county and it has put up offices in the county. So you find uh, now people asking, who do we go to? Because the ministry um, does not have a permanent residence in the county. But the authority has come and put up a permanent office in the county. So uh, who do we go to? So I think the main problem um, during this uh, um, pandemic and with the slowdown of operations is the communication gap, communication between both tiers of government, communication between the investor and, um, uh, and the government, communication between the government and the community. There were various lapses which came up and I think that was brought up very well by Valerie in her presentation. That's it for, from this side, Patrick. Fantastic, <clears throat> excuse me, fantastic Stella. And I think you really hit on the theme of uncertainty and in times of tremendous change, people can be left wondering, are the benefits that we expected still coming? Is there a way to address the concerns and the risks that we're facing? And uh, really powerful and uh, thanks very much. So what I'm gonna do, we have, we have some, some fantastic questions that have started queuing up in the, in the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to try and combine and put some questions together so we can get feedback from the, from, from, from the speakers. I, I want to start, we had a couple of questions about sovereign wealth funds and stabilization funds and um, almost going in, in, in different directions. One of the questions was, are these funds still relevant today as the oil and gas industry changes um, dramatically? And another question went in the other direction. Maybe they're more important than ever as resources that countries can use to um, start to invest in diversification and use oil revenues to build up the rest of the economy. Um, Benjamin, I was thinking maybe I would turn this to you first just for any reflections on the role of Ghana's um, stabilization and heritage funds and whether your or the, or the country's views on, on the role of those funds has changed as sort of the long-term of the industry becomes more uncertain. Um, I'm gonna turn it to you just a note. I wanna get through as many of these as we can. So to all three of our speakers, you know, if you can answer these questions in, you know, in, in a couple of minutes, that will en enable us to, uh, to, to get through uh, uh, and, and answer a lot of them. So Benjamin, over to you. And Valerie, I may come to you with, a, with the same question afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Patrick. I think like the other person said, I think it's more important now to, to think of the stabilization fund than ever. Because, uh, I mean, the resources are still underground. And then once we try to change policies, incentivize investors and bring the oil out, the idea of the stabilization fund is for the, the generations to come, okay? Uh, we have the heritage fund, we have a lot of different funds. So I'm not just thinking about the, uh, the stabilization fund because for us, it helps in trying to balance the budget, okay? So as uh, we also try not to depend on just the oil economy, other areas uh, of the economy need to also be developed. 
So if uh, there's a shortfall in budgets, definitely the stabilization fund is very important. Not just the stabilization fund, the heritage fund, which is for future generations, is also very, very important. So for Ghana, we are not going to change anything about that. What we need to do is to have to cope with the new normal and make sure we can we can explore, uh, re replace uh, uh, reserves, and be able to continue exploring to replace reserves and to produce to get a revenue for the development of our people and the, and the whole country. I think that's what I can say about. Thanks very much, <laughs> Benjamin. Valerie, do you have a, a, a reaction on this question? Yeah, I completely agree with uh, Ben. I think it's uh, more important than ever. Um, and I think I would just add that, um, you know, the, the top ups, uh, the fiscal top ups to the stabilization funds and heritage funds that are established are going to be limited in time. And so the, I think the, the key thing is to spend it wisely and to think strategically about what sectors to, to support with it what investments to make. And that if, if you can't tap into that eternally, then you, you maybe don't think as much about just gapping holes in your budget and you know, spending erratically. Uh, it's really, I think that's the, the most critical thing is how, how strategic you are in, in spending that money after. Great, thanks very much, Valerie. Um, I, I'm gonna turn, now to a question, and I'll put this to Stella and, and to Benjamin first. Um, we have a question about local content. Can the speakers comment on how they are trying to broaden local content opportunities to have the wider application base as described by Valerie? You know, I, I'll just add a little bit of, con of uh, to this question, which is, you know, Valerie talked about how local content has always been challenging to develop in this sector. Um, and now as as your countries look to the future, um, there's a question about what local content even means or, or, or how, to how to develop skills and abilities um, from the petroleum industry, but that have a broader application that can thrive even um, over the longer term when petroleum may be a, a smaller part of the economy. So any, any, anything you've seen or that you're trying to push through um, in order to rethink about resilient local content. Stella, I, I'll turn it to you first. Just, uh, I know that one of the big expectations in Turkana is jobs and economic opportunities associated with this sector. Is that, are, are either people's demands or the government's approach to them changing? Thank you, Patrick. Well, um, with, uh, formation of a resilient local uh, content, I can say uh, what has happened is that when in, much in aspects of, let's say, agriculture and food production, we have had, um, when, the, when the project was going on, we had people trained on uh, ways of developing agriculture, especially in this dryland agriculture, food production, you know, uh, re chicken uh, and chicken projects and such. So, uh, that has been able to diversify because you do not have to be in the oil industry to eat. So at least, um, and another thing that we saw was that uh, during the, uh, the project, we had improved infrastructure because during the early oil project, uh, the road had to be made. So this has shortened the time to get maybe from um, here to Kitale, which is where most of the food was coming from. So with uh, diversification into things like agriculture. So we find that um, at least now we, we don't have to go to Kitale for food. Yeah, at least that has come in. So we, we have sort of like entrepreneurship has become the main um, achievement or rather the main area where local content has been very strong in developing. Thanks, Stella. Um... Benjamin, over to you for, for a national perspective on, on this from Ghana. Yeah, yeah. Identify is that we always say, look at content. What do we really mean by that? We have to identify our content as a Ghanaian content. What do we need 
Is it jobs that we need or train our people to take over businesses? So uh, for us, the Ghanaian content uh, started even with law, uh, the Petroleum uh, Explosion Production Law, Act now one, and that any international company should at least have an indigenous Ghanaian company as a partner to have at least about 5%. That is the first content as far as the oil uh, and gas industry is concerned for us so that they can develop the expertise and possibly when uh, these oil fields are at the stage where the IOCs don't think it's profitable, these small indigenous Ghanaian companies can take over and continue to produce since their uh, over overheads might not be that big. Again, we realize that, and that is, this is being championed by the, 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 the regulator, the Petroleum Commission, it, it taking up uh, some uh, technical universities to take some people out for training, especially in welding, offshore welding, because we realize that, I mean, some, we, we couldn't afford to fly people from Malaysia, from other countries just to come and weld. When uh, they tell us our people don't have that certification to go offshore to weld. So we are training those people so that when they come, they, they train other people. So these are a few things that we are doing. And then we're trying to also to build, to, to build the content in the service provision. There, there's a, a provision where if a local company bid for, for, for some contract or some service, there should be some allowance and uh, some, I wouldn't call favoritism, but that's some kind of consideration. So that is our content, it's not necessarily in getting jobs, but training people to take over uh, from other things that we can do, and then engaging Ghanaians to, to, to do uh, what they can do to at least participate in the oil industry. So that is some of the Ghanaian content that we are developing. If there's time, I might talk about more, but this is what I can say now. Thanks. Th thank you, Benjamin. Um, I think it will allow me just to add as well, even in Trukana, yes. we do have the same. If you're coming into Trukana and to do a business, at least make sure that you train the locals to benefit yeah. from the skill which you're imparting in the sector. So that is, in as much as it is a national, but at, the, at county level, we're also very specific focus to that. as well. Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah, uh, Patrick, to add to uh, Stella, we have that one as the national, as the international company training the locals. But this one, government through the Petroleum Commission has taken up upon itself to itself to train our own people from the technical universities so that they come and train our people up, apart from, and then they are, they call it something welding certification linked to Canada, where we we'll get the, that offshore certification, not from Ghana, but from Canada and the US. So they can be recognized. So we have both. Apart from uh, uh, the oil companies training the locals, we yeah. as a country have also taken upon ourselves to train our own people along certain lines, so that we can cut out expatriate uh, uh, employment and uh, innovations of the country. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, now we've got just about five minutes left, and we have a we have a a series of questions and I wanna make sure we, uh, on the topic of energy transition, and I wanna make sure that we get to that and give the speakers a chance to respond before we close. Um, as Valerie said in her presentation, one of the big questions um, that's coming out of this period of the pandemic is, is this accelerating the global transition away from fossil fuels um, in a way that will impact uh, the economies of new producer countries? And we have three or four questions in the chat about, whether the, the, the prospect of looming energy transition is changing plans in your respective countries around gas to power um, uh, uh, projects, around green energy investments in things such as hydrogen, around diversification and the need to invest in other sectors away from, from oil and gas. And so I'm gonna use this, I mean, in the spirit of the sort of bridge to the future, I'm gonna use this as sort of the, the final question for each of you. How are you thinking about the energy transition and, and preparing your, con your economies to embrace it and to use the sector today as a, as a bridge to the future? I'm gonna go with Ben um, for first reactions, then Stella, and then Valerie, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to respond and, and to kind of uh, help us close. 
one minute for each of you for a very tough question or a very broad, big question. Yeah, if you ask me about the transition, I have a position that the transition might come, but it's not now because we will continue to depend on fossil fuels, okay? Of course, I mean, we are using gas in Ghana to produce power. So uh, we will go along that line, but we are also looking at this carbon capture along the line. But if you ask me, the, trans the transition might come, but not now. And for us in Ghana, we will as much as possible produce uh, fossil fuels or oil efficiently, try to minimize uh, pollution, but we will continue to stay with the fossil fuels and use gas for power. But we know the transition will come. But for us, it might take a longer time. Whilst we, we go ahead to exploit what we have now, uh, but make, make sure that we do it efficiently, reduce pollution and save the environment by use the, 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 the fuel that we need to develop our country. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I, I'm, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna resist my temptation to ask follow-up questions. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Stella, for, from the view from Kenya and, and Turkana, and from your, for yourself. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I think in Kenya, we, we are going hand in hand uh, with, re, with green energy, because like here in Turkana, we do use a lot of solar, because as I said earlier, we have, it's a marginalized place, so we, do use a lot of solar in our projects in schools, in dispensaries. And the, uh, Kenya, I think, is very, very strong when, when it comes to renewable energy from uh, the geothermal and the solar. So for us, I think we are very open as a country and Trukana as a county to uh, renewable energy. And it's something that we have taken it up, I think, positively and even implementation. It's not something that is still on paper but it's something that is actually going on uh, as it is. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stella. Um, Valerie, over to you on this question, including maybe if you can respond to one of the questions about what we as a new producers group are doing to, to help address these questions or how we're thinking about that in the future, but your broader views as well in one minute. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I think what Stella has said is, is quite true of a lot of the members of the group is that they're not already, uh, many of them are not producing large quantities of fossil fuel that would meet their energy needs. And so they automatically, they're sort of leapfrogging a lot of the previous development models and, and are focusing on renewables and lower carbon energies to, to meet needs today and not not go into those sort of carbon lock-ins that you know the Persian Gulf countries, for example, had in the past, uh, among others. Um, and I think uh, there was a there was a, uh, and it's interesting that even the pr new producers um, like Guyana uh, are also thinking about renewables. And and a lot of the countries in our group are very much in the front lines of climate impact. Uh, so. I think it's really a key, it, it is a key issue across our group and, and coming to terms with this transition impact, the, the risks that it, is, uh, that it presents, but also the opportunities is something that we're, we're finding increasing interest in across the group. And I think, you know, for, for managing the transition, one of the key things that our group is trying to do is really getting the oil the oil company, the, sorry, the oil officials in government to speak to those setting climate targets, to speak to those that are doing the energy planning and, de and development plans in the country. And that joined up conversation, I think is the best way to manage uh, the transition for, for these emerging producer countries so that they can get the development goals they need, but also keeping in mind uh, the, broad, the, you know, the, the broader impact that, that fossil fuels will have. Yeah, uh, Patrick, if you allow me, uh, we of in Ghana course, yeah. have just stayed away from uh, renewables. I mean, our energy mix, we have the, we are developing a solar. And now even if you go to the office of the president, I mean, the presidency, all the car parks, we have solar panels there that are producing uh, power for them. You go, we decide to start it from there. And the Ministry of Energy, our rooftop is solar panels. Hmm. 
and I have solar panels in my home so <laughs> that when the main lights goes off, the solar takes over. So it's not like we are not exploring the renewables. Yeah. Yep. Right. Now, even street lights, we are using solar panels for street lights. Yep. So we are looking at those things. But what I'm trying to say is that we are, like Valerie said, we are not producing that much and not polluting yep. that much. Right. You know, but, but yeah. I mean, we, we will continue to do the right thing, produce what we need to produce, but we have the energy mix where we can go into solar, uh, nuclear. We are even exploring nuclear uh, yeah. and, and the wind and other things. So we are looking at it. The transition, I said, will come, but it's gradual and slow. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. And that, thanks so much, Ben. And uh, please join me around your, your, your computers all over the world in thanking um, all of our panelists for a rich and, and, and interesting discussion. Um, I, I always like to try and close these things with a couple of takeaways. And actually, Ben, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up from where you left off there in, 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 in reflecting on some of what I think we can take away from everything that you all have said with three thoughts. One is that um, I think there's a, what's become clear in all of your conversations is there's a real need to sort of strike a balance today and over the long term, right? In um, benefiting from, from revenues and economic opportunities that are associated with the sector, but trying to build that bridge to the future and realizing that the party won't last forever. So it's um, responding to this crisis. You know, the, there's that old saying, never let a good crisis go to waste. And that's what we're seeing in a lot of the new producer countries is thinking today about what to take home from this shock as governments and as societies think about um, how to manage oil and gas today, but with an eye towards a longer term future. Um, and then the, the, the second piece that I would say is just a, a final takeaway is something that really came out in your presentation, Stella, which is, um, communications in times of uncertainty are more challenging than ever, right? People have big questions. Where are we today? What's gonna to happen five years from now? You know, is there an oil market 10 or 15 years from now that looks anything like it does today? And it's one of the big challenges. And one of the things that I think we've seen across the group is kind of reinvestment in trying to figure out how to communicate amidst uncertainty to a public that is asking a lot of questions. And I think that's a big challenge today as we're still in the pandemic and will continue to be a challenge as, as all of uh, these global transformations continue to progress. So um, I'll leave it with that. Thanks so much to all the panelists. And just to echo something Valerie said at the beginning, um, for those of you who haven't been a part of the group but are interested in being more engaged in new producers group activities, please get in touch with Chatham House, with NRGI. I've posted the website uh, on the chat um, and we will continue to carry forward um, activities around fostering resilience and what that means today and what that means going into the future. So Valerie, unless if you, if you have any final thoughts as our leader, feel, feel free to share them, no? Okay, otherwise, thanks so much for all of your time and thanks in particular to our speakers and we'll look forward to being in touch. <laughs>